Uh, so I'm, I'm Polly Erickson. Um, I work at Illery, but I have, um, in previous incarnations, spent quite a lot of time thinking about taking systems approaches to food security, um, particularly in the context of global environmental change. And I continue to work um, with two of the systems, I guess you could call them CRPs, the one on dry land systems and uh, the one on climate change. Um, so I thought I would just give a couple of um, things I like, about, I like about this approach as someone who considers herself very much to be a, a systems thinker, um, but has also you know, had a lot of interactions with the nutrition and food security community. So you know, as many of the speakers said, I, I do, I think it's really great to finally be looking at the interactions between components at a level greater than the household. Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of nutrition experts get very concerned with, well, the outcomes of interest are ultimately at the household scale, and so they miss this bigger picture. So I, I do think this is a very novel and new idea. Um, and I, I guess I, I disagree with the, the previous speaker's comments um, as a, someone who um, has done a lot of work around resilience um, and uh, the need to, 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 to help uh, vulnerable communities buffer against shocks. I, I do think that there's something intrinsic with the, with, with the systems approach. I didn't necessarily see that that much in these, in these, in these presentations, but um, I do. For me, what's novel about, about a resilience idea is understanding how, how shocks can, can, can bring people down into, into levels that it's very, very difficult to get out of. Um, but that's really another discussion. Um, I guess what, what the, the sort of provocative or challenging questions I would, I would pose to this approach really come out of, of um, ongoing work that, 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 that I'm doing. And so um, none of us has really, and I'm, you probably have in other sessions, but we all know that there's an, a problem of the evidence gap between demonstrating the links between agriculture and nutrition. And so it's great now that we have this, you know, ecosystems approach, but you know, building on what Pear said, how will you set up research, yeah, that avoids the pitfalls that the agriculture and nutrition community is finding itself in now? How do we know, how, how, how we, it's great to say that a systems approach highlights these interactions, but to avoid all of the systems complexity, you need some very careful, thoughtful research hypotheses that say, okay, this is the link between healthy soils, nutritional outcome, um, agricultural diversity, and, and, and nutritional outcomes. Um, I see Delia in the back of the room. Um, I, I think disease interactions lend themselves very well to this, and I know a lot of the, the eco-health health work has done that. Um, but if I could just give an example from my own work. So I am very embedded in the community that works with Climate Smart Agriculture, and I would actually challenge you to say that we are still struggling no, to make that a meaningful concept. No, I didn't say you're struggling. We're um, struggling. <laughs> And so um, I, because of my background in food security, I'm, I'm constantly challenging this climate smart agriculture community to pay attention to the trade-offs around climate smartness, right, which is largely about adapting to, to changing production conditions and trying to mitigate. Wh where's the food security angle here? And so, you know, I, I periodically get asked to review papers that purport to be talking about climate smart interventions that will enhance food security. And when I really drill down into the evidence, they're making some very tenuous links uh, between nutritional outcomes. I mean, there isn't even the body of evidence that we need on how growing, let's say, drought resistant crops could, could, won't, will or won't have the same nutritional content. I mean, I know that there's a, a few papers out there. And so actually, ideally, it's the links between changing climate conditions and disease that are better, and, and nutritional outcomes that are better established than the links between changing climate conditions, changing production conditions, and nutritional outcomes. So that's just something there. Um, I thought Pear was going to be harsher as an economist because... Um, I'm a nice guy. <laughs> you said you're right. You told me you are going to be nice. Um, so I can just, just say sort of my, the, my last two comments really. You can't talk about agriculture contributing to nutritional, nutritional diversity without understanding consumption patterns and income, that people don't just grow food to be nutritious. They largely grow food to earn money to buy food. Um, and then finally, um, I would really like to talk to the Malawi case study about how do they approach the, the considerable challenges that we all face um, in terms of incentives to really manage our landscapes differently? And so what do we need to do to make higher nutritional outcomes uh, more of an incentive? Yeah? Um, we were so used to thinking that economic incentives are there. And then lastly, another plug for, the, for a systems approach um, is that um, asking, asking farmers to adapt how they farm to have better nutritional outcomes forces them to make trade-offs with, as I've already said, other other production objectives, and a, a systems approach lends itself very well, very well to that. 
So I'll be quiet now. Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alex.